Hello there, welcome back to Jenny Designs with Paper and this week's episode of Crime and Coloring, where we take an alphabetical journey through the United States and revisit some of the earliest crimes. But before we talk crime, let's talk coloring. A couple of videos ago, I used this color palette to do some ink blending through a Concord and Nine stamp and stencil set. And today I'm going to use the same color palette in Copic markers to color the same Concord and Ninth stamp. So I have the Concord and Ninth in bloom stamp set that I will be inking up in Simon Says Stamp Intense Black Ink because it is alcohol marker friendly. I will be using the large image in this stamp set again, and I will be stamping it in my Misty stamp positioner. I will leave the stamp in my Misty because I want to stamp over it when I'm done to, because there's a lot of the really detailed black lines in the stamp image, and I want to put them back in nice and strong. I did realize that I was going to have to use my um, sticky mat and I was going to have to remember where on the sticky mat I placed my paper because I'm going to take it off the sticky mat to color. So lots of things to work on while I am trying to color and put this card together. Um, the sentiment for my card today comes from a die cut, a Simon Says Stamp um, die set that I will cut out four times and use my Xyron sticker maker to create a thick sentiment cutout. And I think that's all of the coloring. So let's go ahead and hop into our crying. Before we start talking about our story today, I want to let you know that after today, we have one state left. I want to keep the series going. I'm just not exactly sure how to proceed. So if you have an ID, ID, words are hard. If you have an idea, leave me a comment down below. Are you looking for serial killers from every state, missing persons, unsolved crimes, arsons? Tell me down below what you would be interested in hearing for season two of Crime and Coloring. However, our alphabetical journey today takes us to the state of Wisconsin. Now, Wisconsin was a territorial possession of the United States after the um, Revolutionary War. However, it was still under British control until the War of 1812. And the outcome of that war finally established Americans or the American government as the controlling presence in the area. Under American control, the economy of the territory shifted from fur trading to lead mining. The Erie, the Erie Canal was completed in 1825, and this facilitated the travel of both um, Yankee settlers, as they were called, and European immigrants into the Wisconsin Territory. The prospect of easy mineral wealth drew immigrants to major lead deposits located at areas like Mineral Point and Dodgeville. Some miners actually set up their shelters in the holes they had dug, earning them the name Badgers and leading to Wisconsin's identity as the Badger State. Now, the Wisconsin Territory was created by an act of Congress on April 20th, 1836. It had been previously known as the Northwest Territory. And the growing population in the newly founded Wisconsin Territory allowed Wisconsin to gain statehood on May 29, 1848, as the 30th state. Nelson Dewey was the first governor of Wisconsin, and he oversaw transition from the territory to statehood and the transition of those types of governments. He also encouraged the development of the state's infrastructure, particularly construction of new roads, railroads, canals, and harbors. He also was involved in the improvement of the Fox and Wisconsin rivers. During his administration, the State Board of Public Works was organized, and Dewey, who was an ab abolitionist, was the first of many Wisconsin governors to advocate against the spreading of slavery into new states and territories. Nearly 21 million gallons of ice cream are consumed by the Wisconsinites each year. Um, they are my spirit people. Wisconsin is a leading producer of ginseng in the United States, and Green Bay is known as the toilet paper capital of the world. And is that because they manufacture it or because a lot of people do TP parties? Don't know. 
The first ice cream sundae was concocted in Two Rivers, Wisconsin in 1881, and the Fox River is one of very few rivers in the nation that flow north. Practically all of the natural lakes in Wisconsin are the results of, are resulted from glaciers. And according to Wisconsin stories, Wisconsin contains more ghosts per square mile than any other state in the nation, including the ghost of our story today. The largest experimental aviation event in the world is the EAA fly-in at Oshkosh, Wisconsin. Sun Prairie Sweet Corn Festi Festival is one of the largest of its kind in the nation. The first circus in the U.S. was in Delvin, Wisconsin. Sheboygan is the bratwurst capital of the world. More than 800,000 deer roam Wisconsin woods, and almost one-third of Americans live within 500 miles of Wisconsin. I keep finding these population density things interesting because it seems like the United States is so huge, and yet our population is close to just about everything. I don't know. It's weird. <laughs> um, Door County, Wisconsin has more shoreline than any other county in the United States, over 250 miles of shoreline. If all of the hunters on, on opening day of deer season in Wisconsin were grouped together, they would comprise the sixth largest army in the world. And Wisconsin was reportedly one of the locations of a Jack the Ripper murder. You heard me, Jack the Ripper. Laura Whittlesey, Whittlesey maybe, was born sometime between 1861 and 1863. And I say sometime because I have no birthplace, no parents' names, no nothing, no date, nothing. Um, I looked um, in multiple family group type, family search type um, databases, and nothing with a Laura Whittlesey showed up. Apparently, Laura moved to Hurley, Wisconsin to become an actress, and there she took on the stage name of Lo Loda, Lada, Lada probably, Morgan, and was affectionately called Lottie by those who liked her, which was everybody. And the name Lotta or Lottie Morgan didn't come up in family searches either. So I hope that somebody has done some better research than I did and has claimed this young woman. <coughs> Excuse me. Lottie was apparently a very pretty young woman. She was liked by everyone she met and she, her friendships were across all of the social ranks and groups of the time. Now, it is reported that she lived with a man named Johnny Sullivan. He was a politician in Hurley. And um, it was also thought, though, that she had many lovers. And these lovers kept her supplied with money and fancy clothes and jewelry. Most people um, thought that her arrangement with Johnny was more business than romance. Like, you know, he was her roommate. I don't know. Lottie did have a reputation of being a fine actress, but she auto also, wow, guys, sorry, also had a reputation of partying. She liked to party with all of the people, and she was at the saloons when they opened, and she was there when they closed. She performed her acts in many theaters in Hurley and the surrounding areas, and she really did have, in newspaper reports, a good reputation of being a fine actress, but she liked all the fine things. She had fine clothes, expensive jewelry, and she had money. And this is what led to the rumor that she was either a prostitute or a kept woman. Because of her friendships with people in the area and because of her um, renown as an actress, the newspapers didn't ever really call her a prostitute. They used other euphemisms, wow, can't speak today, when they reported on her life. Um, they called her a courtesan. They called her a sporting woman or one of the demi modes, which I had to look up, and that is someone who is on the fringes of proper society. The Montreal River Mine and Iron County Republican said, quote, she carried herself with all the propriety possible for her class, was vivacious, sprightly, well-informed, and was universally known here and at Ironwood and Bessemer. 
It seemed that Lottie didn't care what people thought of her. She just wanted to enjoy life. And she seemed to be living the charmed life she had moved out to Wisconsin to live. Hurley, Wisconsin was a tough iron mining town that was created as the territory became a state. The frontier of the United States, as Wisconsin was then, was the scene of many brutal crimes and Hurley, Wisconsin had seen its share of frontier violence. But nothing prepared the town for the brutal events of the morning of April 12, 1890, when the mutilated body of Lottie was found in the filthy alley between two lowly dive bars on Hurley's main drag. There she lay in a pool of her own coagulated blood with a deep cash gash in the side of her head, about four inches long, running from the temple to the back. At her feet was her own 32 caliber revival with all the rounds accounted for unspent. She never got a shot off. She also had another wound that looked like it could have been a gunshot wound, but there was no bullet or residue. So one theory was it was probably a stab wound. A reporter found a blood-stained axe in a shed nearby and it was determined to be the murder weapon. No one could find a motive for the murder. Lottie was fully clothed when she was found, which meant, she, and it did not appear that she was the victim of sexual assault. The police also ruled out robbery because Lottie was still wearing her diamond earrings and other jewelry, which was valued at more than $5,000. This had to be a personal matter, right? I mean, who kills someone and leaves their money and jewelry if it's not personal? Plus, it appeared that her killer was lying in wait for her to be outside watching her and waiting for her to be alone. And for further proof that Lottie Morgan was a town favorite, she was given an elaborate funeral by the town that included a beautiful display of flowers and a procession featuring a brass band. The town also raised nearly $200 to investigate the crime, crime sorry, words are hard, and a grand jury was convened to uncover the mysterious circumstances that led to Lottie's murder. And where evidence is short, theories abound. One of the theories was that one of Lottie's reported lovers was a former policeman. And some speculated that through him, she was working as a police spy and that the criminal she had been spying on discovered her secret and took their revenge. That is one convincing undercover identity. Here, let me be an actress who takes up with a former policeman. And Okay, anyway, moving on. It seemed just as likely that the evidence of a personal grudge might link to a jilted lover or the wife or girlfriend of one of Lottie's lovers. But this was dismissed almost easily <clears throat> and very quickly for the most obscure, ridiculous reason. Here's the reason. Women didn't commit this type of violent crime. This was two years before Lizzie Borden came along. And I guess only good news traveled then? I don't know. I've, I've done enough research to know that women committed crimes. But in the little town of Hurley, Wisconsin, it was inconceivable that a woman could have committed the crime. So it couldn't have been a jilted wife or a jilted girlfriend. Moving on, the police and the public had another kind of a favorite theory, and it was very specific. There had been recently a nighttime robbery at the Hewley, sorry, sorry, Hurley Iron Exchange Bank, where the thieves netted about $39,000. Lottie had been subpoenaed to testify at the trial because the inside of the bank could be seen from the window of Lottie's apartment. Um, this, in my opinion, turned out to be a much less probable theory than any of the others because Lottie refused to testify. She even left town once to avoid being called to the stand. And she repeatedly said that if she was forced to testify, she would become a hostile witness. The court eventually did find Ed Banker and um, Phelps Perrin guilty of the robbery without Lottie's testimony. I believe one of the men worked for the bank, but I didn't write that down, so I don't remember exactly. But because they were found guilty without her testimony, they then became the prime suspects in her murder. 
I'm not sure that they would risk murdering her when she had openly refused at the risk of her own freedom to testify against them. So either, I, I don't even know. I have two theories about that. She either knew who did it and it wasn't them and she wasn't going to rat out who did, or she did know that it was them and she still wasn't going to rat him out, but whatever. So the police move on from that theory and they continue to look for clues and nothing is turning up. In May, the County Board of Supervisors offered a $500 reward for the apprehension of Lottie's murderers, but still nothing came of this. Then one newspaper reporter had a new theory. His article, or their article, compared her murder to some of the murders happening in another part of the world. Lottie's murder was described and compared to the white chapel crimes, which were ha which were, had been committed by Jack the Ripper in 1888, just two years before Lottie's death. The article even went as far as to say that the police were actively investigating the link between Jack the Ripper and Lottie's death. But as time went on, the police and the people of Hurley faced newer crimes and Lottie's case went cold, and the evidence that they had wasn't enough to find a suspect, let alone try someone for murder. And in the sad way of the world, Lottie Morgan's name disappeared from the newspapers, and her unsolved murder was forgotten. It is always so sad to me when someone is killed and nobody is held accountable for that. I just feel like I'm so grateful for forensics now, because that doesn't hardly ever happen anymore, right? Poor Lottie. Let's um, talk about this Jack, Jack the Ripper link. So there is one blog I read that goes into a lot of detail, and I've linked it down in the info box below. And according to this blogger, the idea that maybe Lottie was connected to Jack the Ripper isn't as far-fetched as it might seem. At the end of the investigation into the Whitechapel crimes, Jack the Ripper was um, confirmed to have killed five prostitutes. And um, they, they con confirmed that, ooh, sorry, flipping things around my, my computer here. There are five women confirmed to have been killed by the same man who went by the name Jack the Ripper. There was one possible murder in 1889 that could have been a Jack the Ripper. And all of those after that are considered copycats or cases where the murderer was using the hysteria around Jack the Ripper to cover up their own crime. There were some similarities between the murders of Whitechapel and the death of Lottie. Lottie was an actress and a prostitute. The Jack the Ripper victims had a day job but worked as prostitutes on the side. Lottie had been mutilated by two strikes to the head with a secondary wound to the body. The Jack the Ripper victims were murdered in the same way, and his first victim was very much like Lottie. Jack the Ripper, though, grew in violence before he eventually stopped committing crimes. So there's a lot to unpack in that theory, right? Um, a lot of the murders that are attributed to Jack the Ripper um, have been, I don't know, attributed to other people. Um, this also assumes a lot. It assumes that Lottie was working as a prostitute, which most people, even though they liked her, that was the assumption. That's how she made her money. It wasn't through acting that she became rich. It was through prostitution. So um, a New York police department um, actually received a letter in 1893 that discussed the murder of a prostitute in New York with some details that had never been released. In fact, the report I read said they were held so secret that only the killer would be able to repeat them. So here this New York City or this New York State Police Department has this letter and this man is telling them about this murder and he's telling them things only the killer would know. And the writer of this letter claimed to be Jack the Ripper, and he taunted them and told them he would never be found. 
Well, after this letter was made public, an investigator from Scotland Yard traveled to New York to look at the letter. And this investigator had been working on the Whitechapel murders. And when he saw the letter, he claimed that it matched the script, like the handwriting and the wording of the letters they had received from Jack the Ripper during the Whitechapel murders. So, and this blog goes on to um, talk about how there is some evidence that Jack the Ripper was um, traveling even um, transcontinentally, right? So it really could be that that is the case, I guess. So if the last confirmed Whitechapel murder that Jack the Ripper um, committed was in 1888 and Lottie was killed in 1890. And then in 1891, a murder, a similar murder occurred in New York by someone calling themselves Jack the Ripper. It kind of lines up like the dates and the details and the brutality all seem to suggest that maybe Lottie's death could have been connected to the Whitechapel murders. But the only question I guess is, did Jack the Ripper come to America? And if he did, would he have stopped in Wisconsin before he headed to New York? And really, I suppose anything is possible. There are theories that um, Lottie still haunts parts of Wisconsin today. So, wow, that's just a crazy connection to another gruesome crime spree in another country in another part of the world. Hey, I know you all know that I like the obscure, weird things, but there's a lot of things about this case in particular that frustrate me. I am frustrated by the lack of information. If she was so well loved, how come nobody knew anything about her? Um, some people even suggested that maybe this was a fictional story, but um, one of the sources I have linked down below um, claims to have done the research and yeah, no, she was a real person and her death was a real thing. And, and there are newspaper reports about her acting about her death. Um, so yeah, she really happened, but I'm also super frustrated by the fact that they, Hurley could not have been so big that they couldn't have known who had a grudge against her even if it was somebody who was just passing through, right? Somebody had to have seen or heard something. Oh, I feel like with all the gossiping that goes around, anytime somebody does something, you would be able to gossip about somebody's death. I don't know. I'm just frustrated. I'm also super frustrated by the fact that because she was wealthy and single, the assumption was she was a prostitute. I wasn't there. I don't know. Um, but historically speaking, a woman in the profession, the acting profession of the time typically did also support their income with sex work. So I don't know. There's a lot of assumptions there because there was not a lot of, um, reporting on her as a person. So yeah, I don't know. But the link to Jack the Ripper was the thing that surprised me the most. Like when I first saw the um, Jack the Ripper in America tagline, I was like, whatever. But it is almost plausible. Like given what the investigation into the crimes in the Whitechapel area of England um, turned up, you know, the, his, his five confirmed crimes based on his letters to the authorities, um, and then the crime, the murder in New York and the taunting letter there as well. I don't know. I feel like it could be a real thing. All right. We have one more state. We have the state of Wyoming next, and then we have to figure out season two of crime and coloring. So leave me comments down below. Tell me what kind of things you would like to see in season two. This is a picture of Lottie. She is pretty. She's quite attractive. I, I'm digging the hairstyle, man. And this is a picture of the article published on April 11th that indicates that Jack the Ripper is a suspect. I don't know, y'all. Thanks for hanging out with me today. I have a couple of other videos here I think you might like. Leave me comments down below. Give me a thumbs up. 
and have a really, truly fabulous, but not too hot kind of day.